my grandfather, this is what one of the things I talk about in the book, he criticized the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, much like people are now in Russia criticizing the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And he was immediately fired from his job. His wife was fired from her job. Their children, that's my father and my aunt, were kicked out of university for one comment that he made in private. I wrote the book before the invasion of Ukraine, but people who've read it know that the preface essentially predicts what has happened. When the powerful uh, forces that hold the current world order together abdicate their responsibility or, or abstain from that responsibility, then other people will attempt to fill that void. I think to remind people, most of all, that what we have in the West, the, the freedom, the prosperity, these they didn't fall out of the sky. They, they're not random occurrences. The problem we've got is if you change the language, you can change the laws without legislating. And, and that's really the biggest problem. If you, if you have laws that say people must be uh, safe, right? That law is there to prevent violence against people. But if you change the meaning of the word safety, you've now got a law that is a law against the people having the wrong opinions in public. The idea that you must force people to be equal is evil whether you're looking at it through the lens of class or race or sex or gender or whatever other bullshit people have come up with. And the reason it's evil is not that it's not a good thing to redistribute wealth and income from one group of people to another. It's the amount of tyranny that it takes to achieve is inevitably going to lead to millions of people being killed as it has done every time it's been tried. Hello everyone, uh, thank you very much indeed for coming to this um, bookshop Barney. Uh, my name is Austin, Austin Williams, I'm the director of the Future Cities Project and this is a special Barney in association with uh, Trigonometry and uh, of course the Battle of Ideas. It's a, a curious setup in the round, you have to excuse my back to some members of the audience and vice versa. Um, so this uh, Barney, if you haven't been to one before, it's kind of like a, hopefully an engaging conversation with an author about their book for them to explain to you uh, what they've written, why they've written it, and the ideas behind it. This one is looking at Constantin Kissin's book, An Immigrant's Love Letter to the West, and with a touch of marketing genius, it came out just as the war started. Um, and actually, if you look now in the news, the Russia uh, says it's losing lots of conscripts uh, to the war, and last week, there was a general, General Oleg Mityayev, was killed. But this book won't cost you an army and an Oleg. Uh, it's only 14 quid. Um, <laughs> don't worry, there's another one coming. Hang on. Um, so it's, it's not about Russia, actually. There's a session tomorrow on Russia. Konstantin's already done a session on Ukraine. This is about kind of British values, British values which are under attack and in some ways need to be defended. Uh, in it, Konstantin says... Uh, freedom, human rights, tolerance, peace, and prosperity must be guarded and never taken for granted. And the Times uh, congratulated you on the book, uh, but then did criticize you for not defining what constitutes the West. And I kind of thought if the Times doesn't realize what the West is, then we've got a bigger problem than maybe than even we thought. Um, Constantine is a podcaster, uh, and together with Francis Foster, who was in the last session, is a co-creator of uh, Trigonometry Show, which has half a million subscribers. Fabulous. <laughs> one man and one round yeah, of applause. No, exactly. That's the sort of, yeah, yeah, yeah. That is the sort of reaction I'm working that's for the kind here. Of, that's the only payment you can afford, isn't exactly. it? Exactly. Uh, anyway, Constantine is a translator, writer, social commentator, and is described as a Jewish-Russian-British comedian, which is a bit like one of those kind of jokes, a Jew, a Russian, and a Brit walk into a bar. Wait for it. The Brit <laughs> says, the Brit says I'm, kind of, I'm tired and thirsty. Could I have a beer? The Russian says, I'm tired and thirsty, could I have a vodka? The Jew says, I'm tired and thirsty, could I have diabetes? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, it, it, it goes downhill from here, right? So the, it's a really, the main thing is it's a really enjoyable book. If you haven't read it, it's on the book stand. I thoroughly, thoroughly recommend it. Really, really insightful book and very challenging as it happens. Um, it's available on the bookstore, uh, so please go and get a copy. The way the Barney works is simply that um, I allow Constantine to do maybe a five-minute 
introduction or as near to five minutes as we can get. Um, then I've got a whole series of questions which I've derived from reading the book, um, which hopefully will allow Constantine to draw out some of the more themes. So if you haven't read it, you'll understand it maybe a little bit more. Uh, and then we come out to you, the audience, for your questions and comments on what you've heard and what you've read, yes, and more broadly. So with no further ado, can we welcome, please, Constantine Kissin. <laughs> I feel like I have to turn around and say thank you over there to the people clapping as well. Uh, thank you for that introduction. I uh, One thing, I, I like disagreeing with people, so I'll immediately disagree with you in that you say the book is not about the war, and of course it isn't. But the main contention of the book is that what Frank Ferreira, who I, I just did a session with on Ukraine, talks about, which is what he calls the West's moral disarmament. And that is the complete loss of belief in our values, in the fact that they're important, in the fact, frankly, that they even exist. The idea that there's such a thing as British values or Western values is now uh, something that a lot of people question. Uh, and my contention is, and has been from day one, and, and of course I wrote the book before the invasion of Ukraine, but people who've read it know that the preface essentially predicts what has happened because... It is, in my view, inevitable that if the West weakens itself morally, economically, militarily, then the 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 law of history is very clear. When when the powerful uh, forces that hold the current world order together abdicate their responsibility or, or abstain from that responsibility, then other people will attempt to fill that void. So it's unfortunately uh, because the situation in Ukraine is obviously very tragic. Uh, but it is unfortunately a very timely book, if I say so myself. Um, but the, the the point of the book is, I think, to remind people, most of all, that what we have in the West, the the freedom, the prosperity, these they didn't fall out of the sky. They, they're not random occurrences. They're the product of centuries of intellectual debate, of actual war, of of endless battles in order to attempt to work out what is a better way of governing than the way of governing that exists in most of the rest of the world, including the country from which I come, which is a strongman leader comes in, uh, kills or imprisons anyone they don't agree with, and then they rule for as long as they can sustain that. We've gone beyond that in the West. Uh, that seems to me to be a better way of doing things. And I'd quite like people in the West to remember that and to be willing to defend that. So I wanted to write an immigrant's love letter to the West to remind people that um, particularly young people who maybe haven't traveled very much, who haven't seen much of the rest of the world, who've grown up in comfort and prosperity, uh, who who don't really appreciate what we have here, how rare it is, how unique it is, and therefore how worthy of defending and protecting it is. Um, and that that's, that's the crux of the book. Very good, very good. Uh, on that basis, I'm sure you'll all now want to buy it, but let me just ask a couple of questions, if you if you will. Um, the gist of the book, I'll just take a couple of quotes and throw them back at you to see what you think. Or maybe you can just develop the point. So you say, um, over the past few decades, ever since postmodernism, moral relativism and multiculturalism became a thing, intellectuals and academics, brackets, many who buy into the Soviet-style theory, have promoted destructive fashions. As a result, the West has lost all self-confidence in its own values. And so that undermining of, of cultural norms, uh, I think we probably all recognize. I was just wondering whether you were positing that this was a destabilization from without or whether it's actually happening from within. How do you... Yes. Yes, it's both. Uh, it's both. And, and you cannot destabilize a society from without unless that society wants to destabilize itself. Uh, so the external forces that would seek to capitalize on the discord and the divisiveness that we have in the West... China, Russia, etc. They've been putting a lot of money into bot farms that amplify these supposed divisions in Western society. But if those divisions weren't there, uh, the, 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 that, those efforts would be completely futile. So we, we've done this to ourselves. And then, of course, our enemies will want to take advantage of that. Uh, and, th and that's where I, I think it's a combination of those two things. Okay, As we make ourselves weaker, yeah. opportunistic uh, adversaries will take advantage. I understand. Of that. Give us, but give us a little bit of background as to how you think that kind of. Because I don't necessarily buy into the many who buy into the Soviet style theory. I don't necessarily think that's a driver. Mm -hmm. But how is this kind of moral relativism? It's a big question. But how has it really occurred? Give us a snapshot. 
I don't know that I, I know the answer to that question. I don't know how, I think it's a very complicated thing. I mean, one of the people we interviewed on Trigonometry recently is a woman called Louise Perry, uh, who has a book uh, called the, the Case Against the Sexual Revolution. And I, I think her central argument is that the technological advances of the, central, of the sexual revolution uh, altered the dynamic between men and women and therefore changed the, the, the status and role of family and, and many other things. And I think a lot of this is technological. Um, the the development of social media has taken those uh, ideas, particularly ideas of the sort of progressive left, they have an advantage online uh, because they sound good and they feel good. They feel so good. Equality and diversity and all of this stuff. It sounds a lot better than, I don't know, closed borders or, you know, meritocracy. These, these things have a different ring to them. And, and so these technological changes that we've seen, they amplify some of the directions of travel uh, that I think are unhealthy for Western society because we're no longer able to argue for the things that actually represent British values or yeah, Western yeah. values. That's, that's a fair point. So like the chapter on language and uh, undermining or destruction of certain kind of words and meanings is really, really interesting. And, you know, there's diversity, there's gender, there's all that kind of stuff we know about. Even, as you say, progressive or even left wing, right? I mean, what do we mean by these things? So again, it, it, just to flip the question around, I suppose, how, as a linguist, how do we deal with that? Do we try to reclaim some of these words, right? You know, I think I'm progressive, right? I wrote a book on progress. Um, yet, if you say that today, it's meant to be, you know, something else. So how, do we reclaim these words or do we give them up as lost and try to formulate new ideas and new ways of expressing ourselves? Well, again, yes, we, we have to reclaim or... Uh, you know, the, the word woke, I think, is a very interesting one because obviously we all know it started out as a self-descriptor of people who thought that they were on the right side of history and blah, blah, blah. And then people like me started mocking it and then it became a derogatory term. And now it's kind of got to a point where I don't really use the word woke because I just think it's tarnished by all sorts of things. So these, these linguistic battles will always go on. My first invitation to people is, first of all, to recognize what is happening with language. So for example, I always like to use this example, the, the term inclusion. Uh, this is one, or, and safety. These are words that have meanings. Inclusion means that people are included. Yet what we'll find in a modern inclusive space is quite a lot of people like me and you would be excluded from them. Or if we talk about something like safety, safety means the absence of physical violence. Yet safety now means that no one disagrees with your opinion. Um, so it is to notice these things. And then the problem we've got is if you change the language, you can change the laws without legislating. And, and that's really the biggest problem. If you, if you have laws that say people must be, uh, safe, right? That law is there to prevent violence against people. But if you change the meaning of the word safety, you've now got a law that is a law against the people having the wrong opinions in public. So the first thing I think is we've got to be aware of it. And then, yes, culturally, satirists and, you know, podcasters and whoever can play with these other terms and make them terms of ridicule so people can no longer have that shield of virtue when they're talking about being woke while advancing some very regressive ideas. Okay. Because it's always done by the tolerant, isn't it? Mm. The most tolerant people uh, are yes. intolerant of yes. uh, me and you. Are you tired of using bulky old wallets, giving you a bulge where you don't want it to be? My old wallet was massive, so it brought all the ladies to the yard, which was a huge distraction and got in the way of my esteemed work on trigonometry. Ridge wallets have an incredible solution for you. This is mine, sleek, stylish, and with an industrial look to it. It can fit 12 cards with cash on the back using a clip like this one or a strap. We've got one for the whole team. I've got one, Francis has one, even our producer Anton has one, but he's from Liverpool, so he flogged his on the black market. The great thing about Ridge is that they give you a lifetime guarantee, which means if you want, you can have only one wallet for the rest of your life. Ridge are so confident in the quality of their product, they will give you 45 days to test drive their wallets. That means you can get the wallet, use it, and if you don't like it, you can return it within 45 days. Because Ridge are such great guys, they're gonna give you 10% off and free worldwide shipping and returns. To take advantage of this incredible offer, go to ridge.com forward slash trigger. That's ridge.com forward slash trigger and use our special code, which is of course, trigger. 
let me move on. On in terms of um, the the Russia story, uh, you say compared to Russia, we have a free and honest media. Low bar. Yep. Um, but and, and as a matter of fact, there is a kind of a debate to be had out as to whether we do have a free and honest media or you know. Well, we don't. But compared to Russia, we do. Well, compared to you know, yeah, compared to Russia, China looks good. Yeah. But I mean, the the point is, is that are you letting the West off the hook by making those? low bar comparisons. Well, I think anyone who follows my work knows that I'm not exactly a big fan of the mainstream media. And I've been very critical about many of the things. In fact, there's a whole chapter in the book, which is a sort of reproduction of a long Twitter thread that went uh, quite viral during the pandemic, in which I talk about how misrepresentation, false messaging on that issue, and on many previous issues, has destroyed our faith in the media, which now means that people, you know, there's there's this kind of online meme of I support the current thing and now there's the I oppose the current thing and people will blindly believe or disbelieve things simply because the mainstream is advancing them. But people also should not be confused. When we talk about societies like Russia and China, there is a difference between a media landscape which is increasingly misrepresentative and not entirely accurate and people choosing and picking what they want to hear and a society like China or Russia. In Russia, for example, there is no independent media anymore. Everything is state controlled. Um, 80% of the Russian public get their news from television, and that is entirely controlled by one man and his cronies who are able to enforce a particular vision of reality on the rest of society. So this is kind of the issue that I address with the whole book, which is, yes, we have problems in the West. Yes, we're not perfect. Uh, Yes, some of the ways that Uh, our institutions have allowed themselves to be degraded over time are really, really bad and dangerous. And I talk about it in the book, but we mustn't throw away the baby with the bathwater. We do need a mainstream media for all the excitement that people like me have about new media and the destruction of the old way of doing things and whatever. That's great. But we still do need mainstream publications that will spend a million pounds doing some kind of genuine investigative journalism. We still do need mainstream institutions. I mean, I think the BBC is beyond saving, but the idea of the BBC is actually quite a good one um, and, and so on and so forth. So, yes, we don't have the perfect media landscape, but it's nothing like uh, these authoritarian countries. And again, we shouldn't take that for granted. Yeah, but th- so how do you play that? comparison line then, right? Because like I say, it's a low bar. That's my cheap shot mm-hmm, mm-hmm. at your argument. But in terms of you saying, you know, we have a f- free press notionally. Freer. Uh, yeah, exactly. So c- by comparison, I get it. <clears throat> but is there a more worthwhile... How would how would you deal with people criticizing the press in this country, regardless of how you do it? But you know what I mean? By then them saying, actually, we are freer than what's going on in Russia. Therefore we should have the ability to criticize the media in the West. Do you know what I mean? mean? How I deal with them is usually I call them idiots on Twitter. But um, uh, but <laughs> I I don't know how you deal with that. I, I, that's just a lack of understanding and a lack of context. Uh, you know, we have a saying in Russia, everything is understood in comparison. You cannot understand the value or meaning of something unless you have something to compare it to. So, um, yes, the media in the West has many issues. Yes, those issues need to be resolved. Yes, part of the solution to those issues is new media attempting to highlight and expose the problems with the old media. Uh, but again, we must not throw the baby out with the bathwater. We are fortunate to have a society in which there is a debate happening. Most other societies in the world have no debate at all. It's it's a uniform view that's imposed from above. Uh, and so we have to we have to remember the value of those institutions, try to call them out when they're going wrong, and, and hopefully that is the method by which they get better. Fine. Okay, good. Um, again, bear these questions in mind and other questions that you may have to develop if you don't like the answer. If you don't like the question, well, if you don't like the question, just move on. But if you don't like the answer, uh, by all means, come back to it in the question and answer session. In terms of the um, education uh, section, you... Criticize, again, I'm going to quote you, and, and obviously I'm quoting you out of context in some regard for the sake of polemic. You're doing the mainstream media For, for me. polemic, <laughs> yeah. Um, it's not a gotcha. It's more, I just want to kind of work out what you're, what you're getting at. Yeah. The, you criticize UK education for not teaching about the ills of socialism, you say. Yes. Quotes, ills of socialism. And you say that's a good, that, that's because, quotes, today's teachers and professors often think communism is a good idea. Mm. I haven't really come across that myself. But anyway, but I get the gist. Um but does that mean that you are kind of in favor, you know, by teaching the ills of socialism, it means the 
in praise of something else by comparative standards. So do you want to have a politicized education system, which... No, I just want an objective one. I'm, I'm quite uh, problematic like that. Uh, I just, I think that we, we need to teach people about uh, history in a broader context. So if we're talking, you know, we spend a lot of time teaching ourselves about the evils of Nazism, quite rightly, of course. But if you just compare on a raw numerical basis, communism is far more dangerous and has taken far more lives. And yet I find that almost nobody in this country understands that. Now, that to me seems like quite a big problem. And you say that there you haven't met many people in academia who think communism is, is a good idea. I've met quite a few, number one. But also you have to consider... Uh, what we mean when we're talking about communism or Marxism. I mean, many of the racial conversations we are now having, I mean, look at BLM, for example, right? That is an organization run by people who are openly Marxist. Uh, many universities have professors who are openly Marxist. And many of the identity politics conversations we have in this country, they're just a new form of Marxism. It, it's a race-based Marxism instead of a class, uh, instead of a class-based Marxism, right? So... Except that that undermines the very notion of what Marx is. I mean, I would say I'm openly Marxist. Yeah. But I don't support Black Lives Matter. Yeah. Uh, so, you know what I mean? So I, I just, I don't necessarily recognize the characterization of this being a left wing. I mean, even, I mean, socialism and communism are different. Uh, Marxism yeah. and communism in some respects are, are slightly different. But so it's kind of really... Real Marxism has never been tried. Is that your phrase? No, no, I think it's your phrase <laughs> no, based on no, this no, conversation. No, I, I, I don't think, I think for, for the record, I didn't say that. But, uh, but, but, you know, so I'm happy for you to put words in my mouth. But, um, but it's that idea about, you know, teaching the ills of socialism was kind of a striking phrase for me. I mean, if you say the horrors of Nazism, mm. I kind of understand it. So are you saying about teaching, you know, what happened under Mao's China or happened what under, you know, what happened in the... Stalinist Russia. Yeah, but but it's not just about what happened under Stalinist Russia. You've got to understand the Soviet Union carried on after Stalin. And it wasn't particularly great after that either. Uh, and, and the point I think that people don't seem to have really grasped in the West is the idea of communism is evil in and of itself. And it leads to evil outcomes because it is an evil idea. The idea that you must force people to be equal is evil, whether you are looking at it through the lens of class or race or sex or gender or whatever other bullshit people have come up with. The idea that you must put your hand on the lever and take from people who have drive and ambition and creativity and whatever else, and you must take from them as much as possible and give it to people who have none of those things and who are not contributing to society. That's an evil idea, and we should just be, be very clear about it. And the reason it's evil is not that it's not a good thing to redistribute wealth and income from one group of people to another. It's the amount of tyranny that it takes to achieve is inevitably going to lead to millions of people being killed, as it has done every time it's been tried. Okay. Uh, I don't recognize that characterization, but uh, fair <laughs> news. Um, the, um, although I recognize Stalinist... Um, purges and also Mao's purges as being one of the greatest. Two but of the it's greatest not just about this is the, this is sorry, Austin. This is what people don't understand. More people died in Soviet Ukraine alone yeah, yeah. from an artificial famine created by the incompetency of the communist state sure. than the Nazis killed during the entire occupation of yeah, the Soviet Union. Right. So it's not just about evil Stalin who came in and wanted to kill certain people. It's about the fact that a system, a central planning system, inevitably results in this sort of nightmare. I don't know whether it does or not. But I mean, the fact is that, I mean, it did, right? I don't know whether you can necessarily project that. But I'm not here to defend Soviet system, right. right? I'm certainly not here to defend the Chinese system. Right? Yeah. We can have a, a, that row again. And, and in China, more people died in the Cultural Revolution and in the, and in the Great Leap Forward mm. than even did in, under Stalin. Yes. So, I mean, so we can we can compare statistics and notes, and I'm against both of those things. So don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. um, but we're we're going off. Well, maybe we're not. We're kind not kind of central maybe to we're the not book, actually. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm going to move on now. Um, <laughs> so bear, bear that in mind. Bear I'll that in mind. that one up as a win for me. <laughs> Carry on. <laughs> Uh, we'll, we'll have that over. I'm, I'm just a, we'll have that over a bit. I'm just um, the um, so the early part of the book um, talks about kind of socialist utopias. Thank you very much. Um, explores hypocrisy. Um, those who profess to be egalitarian mm -hmm. but live the lives of privilege. Mm -hmm. Kind of uh, quite an interesting uh, take. You, you, anybody that has a good Michael Moore is all right by me. Mm -hmm. uh, Michael Moore, you know, talks the good talk, but then it has several houses. You say, you say, then you say, Engels had many factories. That old chestnut. You call the Bolsheviks grifters. 
That's a good one. Um, but anyway, but but actually, you are known, I think, for tackling the content of what people say rather than necessarily their background. So, uh, w- is that a fair line of attack? It is a fair line of attack because uh, I am known for pointing out the hypocrisy of people who say one thing and do another. And I think people like Bernie Sanders, who went on holiday, he, not just on holiday, his honeymoon was in the Soviet Union, right? While people, while people from my country that I come from were starving, were impoverished, were struggling to 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 have basic necessities. He was there being given a tour by by people he thought were just ordinary citizens who were actually KGB agents whose only job was to take around gullible Westerners like Bernie Sanders. Um, that and then he now is a multi 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 millionaire who preaches socialism for everybody. It's hypocrisy and it's complete nonsense. I have much more respect for a Marxist like Cornell West, for example, uh, who actually lives with the things that he preaches. My issues with people who are being inconsistent with the very principles that they espouse and in the process impoverishing all of us. All right. Uh, I won't mention private schools. Anyway, no, just a joke. No, no, no. What about uh, them? uh, Anyway, so the next question <laughs> is um, comedians being targeted. It's kind of interesting that um, there's um, there's this kind of shtick that um, comedy or comedians are the last bastion of free mm. speeches, which is actually quite interesting, isn't it? Mm. And just take a look in the last year, two years or so, comedians getting cancelled left, right and centre. Um, and it's that idea that um, comedians should be allowed to say things in the context of a comedy routine, which kind of pushes the bar, pushes the boundary. Um, so do comedians... Should comedians have bigger room for manoeuvre than, say, me and you in this room? I mean, or maybe put it another way, why has it occurred that comedians seem to be in the forefront of actually challenging those kind of very walk uh, speech code boundaries that you know we're all having to put up with? Well, the truth is that Austin is most comedian most comedians are nowhere near challenging <laughs> the woke boundaries of the modern that's, that's society. They true. are that's actually true. enforcing them on other yeah, comedians. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the few of us. Uh, people like myself, Francis, Andrew Doyle, Leo Kirsten—I mean, I, I can go on for a while in this country who are, are doing that, uh, have all been pushed out of the mainstream comedy industry one way or another and have had to create things outside of that in order to, to even get yeah, our voices yeah, heard. Yeah. But the reason that uh, that we are at the forefront of that is we are constantly, we, we use irony and satire a lot. We say things that we do not mean. Uh, and in a society which deliberately misrepresents jokes as somebody's actual opinion, uh, comedians are obviously going to find themselves in the firing line pretty quickly. Um, and of course, comedians, the other the job comedians are actually supposed to have, in my opinion, is to push back against the dogma of their day. The dogma of the comedians who, the, the dogma that existed 20 and 30 years ago, when I was growing up, my heroes were people like Bill Hicks and George Carlin and others who were pushing against the Christian right, who were the ones saying, you can't say that, you can't do this, you can't, whatever. Uh, They've been replaced by a religious left. Uh, And it's the religious left that is enforcing its dogma on everybody at the moment. Uh, and And the comedians who are attempting to challenge the dogma of the day find themselves up against that. That's why uh, it's funny. You've got uh, people on the Christian right now defending a comedian's right to be offensive, which to me is just mind boggling. Yeah. What, what, what about, um, well, let me give you two quotes in the book, which I just want you to resolve for me. One is where you say more and more comedians are self-censoring for economic reasons and promoters are unlikely to rebook the act if they perceive it to be divisive. Okay. We've got that. Then you say um, the beauty of capitalism is that consumers assert their democratic power with every penny they spend. So you have this kind of consumer power, which you describe, which the first quote seems to be kind of cancel culture, that people are cancelling you and not coming to your show, not you, one show. Um, but then the beauty of capitalism, people are allowed to do that. Yes. Is that a contradiction? or is uh, that No, there's no or? contradiction because the comedy environment in this country is a complete... Uh, cabal. It's a monopoly run by a a handful of people who decide who gets which opportunities. And if the comedy industry in this country, as it has done, decides that uh, the most important thing about a comedy show is that it's diverse, as opposed to that it's funny, uh, then you end up with the comedy shows that we've ended up with. And then what happens is they get cancelled by the market. But first, the ideologues who are booking those shows and making those shows uh, they get to impose their will on a show like Mock the Week, which inevitably gets cancelled. They get to impose their will on a show like The Mash Report, which I actually wrote on for a while, 
which inevitably gets cancelled. They get to impose their will on a show like Live at the Apollo, which will soon be cancelled because no one watches it anymore. So you've got a deluded monopolistic cabal that runs the industry, and then you've got the market which punishes them for the things that they're doing that don't actually meet what people want to watch. And I always have to say this because it always sounds like I'm sort of whining and complaining. I had a great comedy career. Uh, I did everything I ever wanted. Uh, I wrote for some great... Uh, shows I opened for some of my heroes on tour. I did my own show in Edinburgh. It's all fine. You can still do it. It's just that much harder. And because of that, a lot of people are terrified. They won't cross any lines. And I can tell you there are hundreds of comedians in this country who would love to be able to do the jokes that they want to do. But instead, they're going around doing dick jokes because it's the only thing that's acceptable anymore. I don't know what, what you mean. Thought, yeah. Uh, but finally then, um, which follows on from that, I suppose, you say, uh, towards the end of the book, you say that your status as an immigrant means that you're protected from the worst of cancel culture. Um, and you describe yourself as Teflon coated, untouchable immigrant. Uh, Slightly optimistic, perhaps. Well, I, yeah. I look at Lebedev and think it didn't work for him, did yeah. it? But I mean, does, does it mean, I mean, would that assume that then you're a bit too obliging? You're too, dare I say, tame? To be cancelled? Are you too, um, I don't know, are you too much engaged in supporting the Western model? Uh, Never been described as tame before, no, I, <laughs> I promise you. It's not a quality people usually associate with me. Um, no, I think the point I'm making about sort of immigrant privilege, if you like, in the context of this conversation is I don't believe that I would be sitting here having this conversation with you if I was a British born straight white man, that great evil thing. Uh, because the book would never have been published in the first place. And it wasn't particularly easy to get it published anyway. Um, there, people don't know this about the creative arts and publishing in this country in general, but um, there, there's literally like one literary agent and one publisher that will publish books like this one. Uh, and so we live in a very restricted environment. And the only reason even those publishers and even those agents and even those people are able to work with someone like me is they can go, well, guys, 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 he's not white. It's okay. Uh, and that, to me, seems like quite a big problem. Oh, there's a hiatus point there. That's good. The inflection threw me for a second. Okay. Right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I've done me bit. Uh, uh, so it's over to you. And again, apologies for my inability to turn. It's an age thing. Gentleman in the awkward corner. Hello. Um, I was just wondering who your literary influences were in writing the book. Uh, not to inflate your ego too much, but it reminded me of Orwell and maybe even Solzhenitsyn. Mm. It's a family member. No, no, no. pressure then, huh? <laughs> uh, can we take this lady as well? Hiya. Oh, yeah, the phenomenon where immigrants are the most patriotic British citizens is not really a new thing. I think it's existed for decades, unlike America where overt patriots more acceptable. Do you think there's something in our character that just quite enjoys negativity? <laughs> mm. uh, I do. Uh, <laughs> I do. The, the, I, I also don't, I actually don't know that I agree that immigrants are the most patriotic. I think they're the ones that are allowed to be the most patriotic in public. I think that's really the issue. I think there's quite a lot of people in this country of every background who are very patriotic about uh, Britain, uh, but they are concerned about being, because you know, being patriotic has been confused with all sorts of, you know, xenophobia, racism, whatever. Um, so, yeah. But in terms of the Solzhenitsyn comparison uh, and uh, Orwell, uh, I mean, those are two people that I have read. <laughs> so I, I, don't, I, I, I feel uh, very British about trying to compare myself to people that I consider great. I, I think uh, I actually, while I'm a, uh, you know, Solzhenitsyn is one of the most formative influences on, on my thinking, uh, and I quote him in the opening uh, of the book. And I um, I, I actually try to avoid uh, repeating his mistake because the mistake that he made is when he was released from the camps, uh, he, he was able to publish um, the Gulag Archipelago and he was eventually invited to go to the West. And he went to America where he started lecturing Americans about what was going wrong with their society. And Americans don't like that, which is why I've come to Britain where you love being told how terrible you are. <laughs> Right. So I can tell I can tell you how to right your wrongs. No, so uh, yeah, the, those are those are two people that I respect very much. I think they they made very good points. And, and the one thing I would say to people, because most people haven't read it, if you want to if you want to understand the way that censorship operates, it, particularly in our society today, read Orwell's preface to Animal Farm, 
where he talks about how much difficulty he had in having it published because even in those days, coming back to our conversation about communism, uh, because uh, the Soviets were seen as necessary to winning World War II, it was it was very, very difficult to publish a book that was critical of that system. So, and and it wasn't through hard censorship, it was through enforced self-censorship. And I think he, he writes beautifully about that. Uh, in terms, very quickly, in terms of the immigrant stuff, I'll follow in because on the, bre- kind of on the, Topic of Brexit, kind of. Uh, I hate to raise that B word, but you say most people don't hate immigrants, they hate the politicians who say they do, which mm-hmm. I think is a really, really important point and m- dismissed or misrepresented by a lot of the media and, and popular opinion. But it's, it's there to discredit kind of popular opinion and that idea of populism, uh, which is then taken on, as we've said before, taken on this kind of dark interpretation mm-hmm. populism rather than it being a popular opinion. How, what do you think about populism, the label of populism, because it, it kind of is brought in to a lot of conversations these days, which maybe uh, it doesn't deserve to, but also it's given this negative connotation. Well, first of all, on Brexit, I voted Remain in that referendum. Yeah. And the thing that really changed my opinion about that issue, to the extent that I've changed my opinion about that issue, was I had to watch the country that I've come to lived in as a dark-skinned immigrant all my life be misrepresented as full of, you know, half the country is racist, half the country hates immigrants, half the country's blah, 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 blah. Well, first of all, that didn't even make any sense to me because the immigration that people were concerned about was mainly from Eastern Europe where people are white. So that doesn't, it doesn't ring true. But also my own experience of living in this country, my very valuable lived experience, uh, tells me that it's complete nonsense. Uh, it doesn't mean to say that populism doesn't exist. Uh, people have always wanted to hear a simplified version of reality that panders to all their prejudices and whatever. Um, but I just, I just think the way we are, we have the conversation about immigration is completely insane at the moment. Uh, I like ice cream. I don't want to eat ice cream for every meal, every day for the rest of my life. And the attitude to immigration has got to be the same. Immigrants contribute. Immigrants are great. But when the numbers become, it's like uh, my, the great man Joseph Stalin said, joke for you, um, the great man Joseph Stalin said, uh, quantity has a quality all of its own. And the problem we have with immigration as a country is not that immigrants are bad people. It's that when I came to this country in 1995, 3% of the British public thought that immigration was a major issue because it wasn't a major issue, right? And then you have the Blair era where more people came into this country in about 10 years that had come into this country between 1066 and 1950. It's quite a big shift. And for people to be concerned about that doesn't make them racist or xenophobic or whatever. You can be in favor of immigration. You can think that people like me, who I would like to think came to this country and contributed and have created jobs for local people and, and blah, 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 are valuable without thinking that open borders is a great idea. It, it, it's, it's not that. And as, I, as you know, I, I talk about this in a book quite a lot. Left-wing politicians, let alone right-wing politicians, have been making the very point that I've just made for the last 30 years. Barack Obama was to the right of Donald Trump on immigration. It's just everyone forgot. Yeah. Well, it was Barack Obama who maintained the wall uh, from America to Mexico, didn't he? But um, and, and the whole issue, which I presume you've been discussing in the last session on Ukraine about sovereignty and about borders, is kind of fundamentally in our face in our face now. So it's something which, which maybe those Remainers who denied its existence maybe have to rethink. Uh, anyway, any more for any more? There's a gentleman at the very back. Oh, there's lots of... Oh, no, sorry, I didn't... <laughs> Because you're wearing T-shirts, I just assumed you were, like, saluting or something. Uh, take this gentleman and then we'll go back to the T-shirt Saluting? Man. What kind of session do you think this is? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm pandering to your Putin-esque uh, agenda. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you, Constantine. Um, you spoke about wanting to have a more objective education system. What role, then, do you think parents should play in helping to shape the national curriculum and the content that their children are learning? It's a very timely topical issue, both in the UK and overseas. And I think there are discussions about it at the Battle of Ideas. And I ask because, obviously, every parent will have their own subjective opinion about what should and shouldn't be taught. How does society manage that? Yeah, it's an interesting question and very much above my pay grade. But what I would say about it is uh, I, for the first 
few years of my life, so from until I was about 13, I obviously was educated in the Soviet education system, which was very good on the hard sciences, the chemistry, the whatever, but also contained a, a huge amount of historical and cultural indoctrination, which everybody knew was complete bullshit. And so the role of the parent, in my opinion, partly will be about, you know, what the curriculum should be or whatever, but actually everything begins in the home. You have to give your children the context for the things that they're being taught. You have to inoculate them against some of the crap that they're going to be inevitably taught in any school. Uh, and, uh, you know, when I talk about a more objective system, I just, I think we are failing to educate our children. And I, this is true for my generation too. And by the way, you know, when I went to school in this country, it coincided with like a five-year period of my life where my family had money. So they sent me to a good school for a very short time before going bankrupt again and, and blah, blah, blah. But uh, I went to a good school and we were taught history terribly, terribly. I learned more in history by watching a one-hour YouTube video than I learned in my entire time at school, right? So I, I don't know that uh, that this gets fixed necessarily in the education system. And I think the, challenging we're, the challenges we're seeing as a result of the sexual revolution and the breakdown of the family are much more where these issues are happening, where... There's not enough parents to basically teach their children right from wrong, the, 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 the stuff that they're being taught in school that is completely nonsensical versus what's actually true and to set a context for the things. So uh, as, as a new parent, this is probably extreme optimism on my part, but I'm sort of hopeful that I can teach my children the stuff that they need to know and protect them from some of the indoctrination they're gonna get in school. Very good, all right. Take these two <laughs> gentlemen, statuesque figures. Oh, yeah. Uh, I think a lot of the problems we have in politics in the West come from the fact that a lot of, a lot of people think that everyone else in the world thinks exactly like us. So, you know, pe people don't understand why Putin would invade Ukraine. People don't understand why someone would vote for Brexit or just disagree with them on, on something. Do you see us recovering from that? Any, any way of, of stepping into other people's shoes and understanding that they have different motives and morals and values and... And, and they're going to they're gonna act on those and, and that drives their behaviour. Hold that thought. I'll take the other guy. Take you, sir, as well. Yeah. Uh, two very quick things. Uh, a personal question. Um, what, are you most, what are you most proud of in the past year? The baby, the book, or America? And the second thing, very quickly, is um, do you think the whole culture war is because everybody's bored and we've got nothing to believe in, i.e. lack of religion? Or would there be a culture war if we actually had things to really believe in and we weren't so comfortable? Mm. Yeah, both good questions. Uh, so the first question is, just remind me briefly because my memory is failing. People, people believe that everyone else across the world... Yeah, yeah, how can we get like people us? to listen to each other and understand each other's point of view to and so on? With yeah. Well, this is one of the paradoxes of the progressive leftist way of thinking because it's all about inclusion and tolerance and understanding and empathy. Yet they are the very people who don't seem to understand that the reason people have different points of view is different genetics, different upbringings, different life experience, different lived experience, different all of these things, right? And that, I think, is a large, largely a product of social media, where, as I say, certain types of ideas get way more traction because they sound better, even though often they're completely wrong. So I think we will get away from that way of doing business when, whenever we find a way to destroy social media. Uh, it's probably the only way. Um, How many subscribers do you have? <laughs> yeah, uh, let's hold on to them, uh, social media. Um, and uh, what am I most proud of? Well, I didn't really have that much to do with the baby, I, I can tell you. It's a very limited level of involvement. Um, no, I, I, you know what? The thing I am most proud of, actually, is that trigonometry is now a small business that employs, uh, including me, Francis, and our producer, Anton, another seven or eight people now, uh, in, uh, about seven or eight people. And I'm, I'm really proud of that. I'm really proud that we employ people, that we give people meaningful work, that people come and work for us for very little money, let's be honest, because they love what they do, because they love being involved in a project that is passionate, where we're all pulling in the same direction. And, uh, you know, Francis and I have been, we've transformed from basically two idiot comedians to actually managing a small team of people and looking after people and making sure that they're developing and what they're doing. To me, that is really the most exciting thing about what I do. Hardcore fans, I've noticed today in yeah. Russia as well. Yeah. Hardcore fans. Yeah. Uh, 
Um, yeah, so I'm excited about that. But in terms of the culture wars, are we just bored? I think you're right that a lot of the problems we have in the West are a function of our comfort and prosperity. Um, and every time something goes badly wrong, I am really hopeful that that is the kick that we need, which is like when the pandemic happens. Do you remember there was that like brief moment when everybody was like, oh, guys, we're a society. We should pull in the same direction. Let's bring some food to our neighbor. Right. And then we had George Floyd and everybody, you know, everybody went mental. The thing that we need, we need to do what? We need to look after people and, and we need to have solidarity with ourselves and whatever. And just there was a couple of months that, that everything was kind of going. I was like, oh, wow, we're starting to unite around this common threat that we face. And then you have Dominic Cummings, uh, who, as Francis always points out, must have been the biggest supporter of BLM because it just took all the attention away from him. Uh, and that happens and the world goes crazy. I mean, you see people posting these videos now from uh, the summer of 2020 where you've got like white people kneeling to black people, right? And I was saying at the time, what this is mental. This is completely mental. On my first day at uni at Goldsmiths like, uh, a year ago, I had white girls come up to me, I'm so sorry for being white. I'm so sorry. <laughs> How nice for you, my friend. <laughs> Actually, there's a terrific. Uh, have you seen this viral video by Russian, uh, by the Russian state? Yes. America, What do you want? Ставь в туалет. I want to go to the toilet. Простите, мистер, что случилось? Да вот парень без очереди лезет тут. И что? Вы не хотите его пропустить? Я? Конечно, конечно. Его надо пропустить. Мы подождем. Его народ долгие годы терпел притеснение белых. Мы перед всеми афроамериканцами в долгу. Простите нас, сэр. Прошу вас. Зачем? Там сзади пара, а не child free. Дело в том, что ваш сын попадает в поле их зрения, и это вызывает у них дискомфорт. Россия, матушка, Россия! Мы возвращаем! It's really clever. It's, well, it, but that's the thing. It really isn't that clever. It's actually very easy to satirize if you can put it on television, which you can't. Yeah. in this country. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, trust me, I can rustle up some comedy writers that could do that a hundred times better. Yeah. It just wouldn't go anywhere. I thought it was quite funny. You know, uh, I, I am, but, I'm not saying anyway. it's not funny. It was great. In relation to your views on the mainstream media, being someone who works within the mainstream media but not in this country, um, what do you, how do you think, oh, what's your opinion of the media coverage of the war? I mean, it's a big question, but what are the strengths and weaknesses in your opinion, of how the war is being covered in the yeah, mainstream media? it's a good question. You've, you've obviously caught me in a massive generalization because the mainstream media is composed of all sorts of different outlets and different people will cover it differently. Um, if, I think, if I think of coverage of the war and the mainstream media, I sort of think of the BBC. And I think the BBC has not been inaccurate, generally speaking, while also... The, the main issue I have is I don't think that you could possibly work out why the war is happening, 
why Russia invaded, what's actually going on on the ground, and what is likely to be the future, and what are the most important issues from the BBC, because all you see is pretty refugee running away from bombs or, you know, uh, the, the LGBTQ survivors of Putin's invasion in Rotherham being integrated with a the family. These are all great stories. I just don't think that they really educate people about some of the issues. And I think it's one of the reasons that the alternative media has been so involved in covering this issue and attempting to bring certain issues into light, because I just don't think the mainstream media is calibrated to educate people and to give them the information that they need because they're much more, you know, it, it's odd to me because I sort of used to think that it's the online space where everything's clickbait. But actually, I often feel now with the mainstream media, they are the ones that are doing most of the clickbait uh, because they're going, you know, if it bleeds, it leads type of thing. And we all get, look, I have family in Russia and Ukraine who've all been affected by all of this. And it's terrible. I just don't know how much yet another story about the poor victims of war advances people's understanding of what's happening. And that has always been my priority to try and explain to people why it's happening. What, why does it matter to the West? And I, I think people really don't understand. Uh, you know, uh, it's funny. I wrote this um, thread on Twitter recently, which was a translation of Vladimir Putin's latest speech that I, some of you probably have read. And I had a bunch of mainstream journalists follow me afterwards and ask me questions. And these are people who cover the war. And I'm like, why are you asking a satirist and podcaster what Vladimir Putin is saying? How come you haven't got a whole team of people analyzing his speeches, breaking it down, explaining to people in the West what he's actually saying? It's a catastrophic failure. And it's important because if we in the West don't understand what's going on, how the hell are we going to react to it in the right way? So why haven't they? Uh, I, I Look, you probably know more about it than me. I am just seeing the symptoms. I can't explain what the disease is exactly. Uh, I think I, there's probably not a lot of money in in doing a three-hour breakdown of, of what's happening in Ukraine. And there's probably quite a lot of clicks in people who want to just see a pretty refugee running away from a bomb. It's a theory. Okay. Uh, there's a one behind you as well. Sorry. Give up on yeah, yeah. <laughs> Straight white Take those two, the, <laughs> those two gentlemen there. We'll take the white guy first. As is his right. Um, just on the history of trigonometry, there's a, a great episode where Constantine and Francis talk for about an hour and a half about the story from being in a flat in Dalston to the empire they are now. And it's very, it's quite life affirming, partly because it's been through so much kind of shit, for want of a better term. Uh, and kind of come out the other side, although Anton doesn't come out of it very well. Um, but, you know, I guess he's the butt of the joke often. Um, but no, I, I wanted to pick up on a point you made in the plenary about Ukraine earlier on and a point that someone else made earlier about how other people see Western values. And someone asked about how we uh, try and, you know, encourage people to see them in a more uh, positive way. But could you give some examples of how in... Soviet Russia and also in post-Soviet Russia, something that we would take for granted, or at least maybe the people in this room would, like liberal democracy or equality or uh, tolerance of speech and so on, would be seen by the authorities or the the people who shape uh, public opinion and, and the culture. What, what would we be really surprised to hear would be a common view in Russia? Well, Russia has never had a single democratic transition of power ever, ever. The first mention of Russia is 882. That's the Kiev and Rus that people talk about. In its entire history, Russia has never had a single democratic transition of power, right? So that seems to me quite important. Um, that's something we completely don't understand. And it's true of most of the world, by the way. It's true of most of the other countries in the world. Democracy is a quite rare quite unique and quite a fragile thing, which is why it has to be guarded so carefully. Um, the, the idea that in the Soviet Union you would express your opinion in public uh, and that opinion was unpopular and you would be safe, was no, it would never occur to anyone that such a ridiculous thing could happen. Uh, in the late 80s, this is why we were having the argument earlier about Stalinism, my grandfather, this is one of the things I talk about in the book, he criticized the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan much like people are now in Russia criticizing the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And he was immediately fired from his job. His wife was fired from her job 
their children, that's my father and my aunt, were kicked out of university for one comment that he made in private. And there are people in Russia today who initially when the invasion happened, they went out with placards to protest and the placards would say for peace. And they would get instantly arrested and dragged away into prison. So then they started going out with no placard at all, just standing with their hands in the air and they would get arrested. The idea that you should be able to protest against your government because you disagree with it, it doesn't really occur to most people everywhere. And the only way that they are able to do so is to go out and get their head smashed in by the riot police. As you see in Russia, as you are now seeing in Iran, as you would see, as you saw in China, of course, it was Tiananmen Square and not just Tiananmen Square, but it was a world, it was a countrywide thing what happened. Um, People in the West absolutely do not realize how rare and unique and precious what we have here is. And to the point where uh, it wouldn't even occur to people in other countries that these things are good things to have because they've never had them. Yeah, it's funny because when I, I taught in China for about six years and uh, when I first took my Chinese students out and I offered to buy them a drink, mainly because it was 25 pence for a pint, mm-hmm. but uh, buy them all a drink. And then one girl said, uh, I don't drink in public. Okay, so, you know, you think, okay, what the hell does that mean? Yeah, I don't drink in public. So I kind of harangued her sufficiently that she explained that in the, in the 70s, the family always used to have their meals outside in the in the village, and then the grandfather got drunk and said too much, and before you know it, he was hauled off, her father was hauled off. So there's a family rule mm-hmm. not to drink in public. You know, and it's like moments like that when, I mean, you've lived it, right? Mm-hmm. But moments like that when you realize this is a different system Mm -hmm. and a different perception about you know what your personal and private versus public experiences so i think it's kind of very useful to to remember that these are very very different social systems Mm -hmm. and kind of very difficult as as somebody was asking at the back there very difficult to grasp the kind of the conception of what it what what china mindset might be i don't know that doesn't not meant to be racist but it's Mm -hmm. it's generally difficult to understand how they think about certain things and interpret them because it's Mm -hmm. of such a different historical magnitude to what we've had in in the west so it's kind of very important point you raise hey francis do you like locals i live in london mate so obviously not the only pleasure i get from the locals is when we share an intimate moment as we watch a japanese tourist get trapped in a tube door But I wasn't talking about the locals, I was talking about our community on Locals. You mean the one where you get phenomenal behind the scenes content when you like your space, when you get to ask incredible guests like Jordan Peterson, Brett Weinstein, Bill Burr, Sam Harris, Adam Carolla, Heather Hying, and others your questions? Not just that, you can get supporter-only benefits like trigonometry mugs, monthly calls with the other top supporters, and even a regular meal with me and Francis. You also get phenomenal behind-the-scenes footage of our trip to America, where we met a whole host of incredible guests and gave ourselves terminal indigestion. We're also starting to do monthly giveaways for locals only. The first one will be signed copies of Andrew Doyle's new book. Plus, you get access to an incredible community of like-minded people who share memes, have fun conversations, and most importantly, you get to make new friends. You can support us with as little as $7 or about five pounds a month, or give us more for the higher tier benefits. Go to trigonometry.locals.com. Go to trigonometry.locals.com and support the show. Take the gentleman Further over, please. Okay, so just um, you, you said you had cast iron um, immigrant privilege be, be before. I'm just wondering how much longer that will last, given um, that the uh, in, in general the left have now discovered from the last two cabinets that you know black and Asian people can be Tories too, and in some cases significantly, significantly more right wing than the um, than 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 their cab cabinet colleagues and also in in america there are more hispanic people who voted for for, for the trump so so is the narrative of the gammon or white privilege is that going to hold forever or, or will they have to come up with some kind of new kind of formulation about who the problematic people are yeah like quasi quite are you superficially an immigrant 
Yeah, well, I don't know. I'm I'm internally xenophobic, I guess. Um, uh, no, I, I think it's it's funny, isn't it? Because uh, anyone with half a brain knows that immigrant communities actually tend to be more conservative, on particularly on social issues, than the native population. Uh, yeah, we pretend that ethnic minorities are this sort of monolith uh, who all believe, you know, in, in eternal progress or whatever it is. Um, I I don't know how that issue is going to play out. I mean. Uh, I don't know how people in this room feel. I don't know how people in the country feel. I, uh, I I think many of these ideas, you know, the idea that a black cabinet member of a conservative government, which is frankly useless at the moment, but nonetheless, uh, a, a black cabinet member of that government has internalized racism because they have the wrong opinion according to some white leftist. That seems to me to be slightly discredited by now. Um, and so I don't really, I think increasingly people take less notice of it. I think the way that we are having this conversation in this room is probably not the way it might have been had two years ago. I think we're all starting to kind of, to realize the, to borrow one of the language tricks, we're starting to realize the gaslighting that's been happening. And I think more and more people will open their eyes to how much, crap they've been sold about it and i think you just particularly as the as the makeup of our society changes as we see that politics increasingly reflects every ethnicity in this country increasingly reflects every variety of person whatever i think that issue will probably go away because people like me and people like you and others just we we're kind of immune to this like if i mean someone once called me a nazi and i was like well, jewish nazi the best kind like it's it gets silly after a while. You know what I mean? Okay. Uh, this gentleman. All right. Um, so I'm for Blackpool. And uh, if, if, if we don't... If so you're oppressed. Well, <laughs> yes. I'm, I mean, I'm probably a thick racist northerner. Northerner. Yeah. Nobody's ever Excellent. really called me out. I work for the BBC, so I can't really say much on, on, on <laughs> social medias about politics. I'm uh -huh. not allowed to have a view. Um, and obviously the BBC is run by a, a guy that used to market fizzy drinks to fat kids. So, um, it, you know, and Bill Hicks, his view on marketeers, you, you I'm sure will remember. Um, for this question, you wrote an immigrant's letter to the West. Have you had a letter back, an actual letter or a direct response back from an individual? And what was it? What was the best one? It was Douglas Murray's uh, very generous review in which he he sort of he he thanked me for writing the book and he said that um, the the feeling is reciprocated. He spoke on behalf of the West, which was uh, <laughs> in Douglas's style and who I love. But um, but yeah, uh, that that was you know um, right or left or whatever. I think Douglas Murray is one of the most insightful public commentators that this country's produced in, in quite some time. Uh, uh, I don't agree with Douglas on everything. I agree with him on a lot of things that he says. I think he's had the courage to address a number of issues that nobody wanted to be honest about way ahead of time. And so when he wrote a, a, a review suggesting that, you know, he was grateful to me for writing the book, uh, you know, that meant a lot to me. Yeah. Any hostile ones? The reviews? Yeah, no, no, no reviews, but the letter, the concept that you've written this book and- Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, it was funny. There was a woman on Twitter who followed me after I translated that Putin speech uh, and she was so enthusiastic about everything that I'd said about it. She was absolutely brilliant. Can't wait to read your book. Next day, she she, she just like sent me a, a hundred like hate-filled messages about how wrong and bad and terrible my book is. Uh, so there was a, I, I managed to persuade one person very quickly. <laughs> uh, yeah. Very good, very good. Uh, Toby? I run a kind of alt media website called mm. um, The Daily Skeptic, was Lockdown Skeptics. And we've had a number of problems with censorship. So I think Facebook have currently banned The Daily Skeptic Facebook account. Um, we were um, closed by um, PayPal um, about a month ago. They eventually changed their minds. but for And it looked as though they did that because they thought we were guilty of spreading misinformation about the COVID-19 vaccines. Um, and I wondered, I know, I know trigonometry has in the past had some similar problems, YouTube videos being removed, you convinced that you're being shadow banned. Not um, convinced, we have direct you've been, evidence. You've been, you've been we have banned. evidence. Direct, it, yeah. evidence. You've been shadow banned. I wondered, um, as, as trigonometry has grown, grown its audience, as it's become a, a business with seven people whose livelihoods you're partly now responsible for, 
has your how how do you now navigate this world do you do you find yourself having to self censor more and more to avoid this kind of um actual censorship by big tech uh no because i, I firmly believe and and francis and I, I think our whole team is united in believing that the point of trigonometry is to explore difficult issues and i think the moment we start doing that i don't think the people in this room would be in this room uh, so we we cannot sell out to that, um, and if the if the day comes that we can no longer do what we do on YouTube, then we will find another way of doing it. And if that means that we all have to take a hit, we've always been very clear. Every time we talk with you know myself, Francis, and Anton about you know well maybe we should like give this person a bit more salary or give ourselves a bit more salary so we can do whatever. We that's always with the understanding that, you know, things may go up as well as down because of the nature of what we do. Uh, what I am very concerned about, Toby, as you, you know, you and I have spoken this about this before, and you've had some issues with PayPal recently, is that, like, if you've got the wrong opinion, you can't have a bank account, which is the direction we're going. That is a very, very dark path. That is a very dark path. And uh, that's got to, I mean, we've got to fight so hard against that because, you know, before you know it, you're not going to have electricity if you've got the wrong opinion. I just think, I think that that is the the, the most scary thing to me. Uh, and uh, I, I wish more people would focus their attention on that. Can I just jump in on the conversation in terms of um, the PayPal issue? I've just cancelled my PayPal account precisely because of your um, uh, problems. But what do you think? Because I'm, I'm, I'm opposed to consumer boycotts. So I had a bit of an ethical turmoil as to whether I should be doing this uh, in support of you or whether I should actually be not endorsing the idea that I can bring my consumer power to, 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 to play on distorting a, a, a company's um, own <coughs> decision-making processes. How do you sit on – sorry, Kirsten, how do you sit on this? Well, thank you for for closing your PayPal account. I think lots of people it's did. It's not all in it, but anyway. Yeah. Well, but I think I think the number of people who did may have contributed to their decision to restore the three accounts of mine that they closed. Um, I think that um, you, you often hear a slightly different argument to the one you made, which is that well, why should we fetter the freedom of association of these private companies by saying they can't discriminate against certain customers on the basis of their political beliefs? Um, uh, you know, you can always. You can always go with another payment processor that isn't going to discriminate in that way, and the market will solve the problem. And I think there are two arguments against that. The first is that, well, first of all, um, PayPal is a monopoly. Um, it's about eight times larger than its nearest competitor, and it's quite difficult to make a success of sites like Trigonometry and The Daily Skeptic, which depend on donations, amongst other things, if PayPal closes your account. Um, the second thing is, I think, you know, it's odd. You hear people on the left, like James O'Brien, making this kind of libertarian argument as though they'd suddenly joined the Institute of Economic Affairs. <laughs> um, you know, he says, why shouldn't they discriminate against you? They're a free company. This is a free society. But you wouldn't say the same thing if they discriminated against someone on the basis of the color of their skin or their religion or their sexual orientation. And I think your political belief should be in the same category. And, you know, to your point, uh, Constantin, I think we definitely do need to do something about this urgently to prevent the emergence of a Chinese-style social credit system in the West, except, you know, without communist authorities enforcing ideological orthodoxy, it's these capitalist corporations in California. What can we do about it? Well, the Free Speech Union is lobbying the government to amend a bill currently going through Parliament to make it more difficult uh, for companies like PayPal and lots of other financial services companies to discriminate against people on the basis of their political beliefs. So whether we'll make any headway, I don't know, but we're certainly hoping to do that. Yeah, and, and everyone should know, I, we at Trigonometry are, are huge fans of the Free Speech Union. I think it's really important um, and you do great work. Can I just add one other thing as well? Uh, coming back to your question about, you know, self-censoring to protect our staff or, or whatever. The one principle, the guiding principle of my life, and I'm fortunate to be able to have this principle because we live in a time where uh, people like you and I are not burnt at the stake, um, is that the truth of it is that in our society, I think... If you make a stand on principle that costs you in the short term, it probably will benefit you in the long term. At least that is a belief that I operate by. I'm sure at some point it will turn out to be untrue. But generally, my the way I try to carry myself in the, in the world is based on that idea, which is that if you stand up for what's right now, 
you may suffer the consequences early, but in the long run, you will be vindicated and actually shown to be correct. And that will reinforce people's support for you. Um, you will find an audience of people who, who believe in what you do. That you know, I know you did a lot of opposing of the government's restrictions around lockdown, which was a big concern of mine as well. And I was frankly, you know, sending quite rude messages to government ministers and whatever, who now say to me, oh, you were sort of right. Do you, do you know what I mean? And, and so I think that standing up for what you truly know to be the right thing, uh, even when it's difficult, will benefit you in the long run. And so from that perspective, if at some point it comes to that we are starting to have trouble with our payment system or whatever, we will find a way. Uh, and I, I hope that people, if more people had that attitude, I think we'd be making more progress faster. And, and I do think in the modern world, it is genuinely true, particularly because, you know, you with the Free Speech Union are able to look after the, the little man who maybe doesn't have a big platform and doesn't want to build a big platform. They just wanted to make a joke at work or whatever. You know what I mean? Uh, so, yeah, I think what you're doing is very important. Very good. <clears throat> Lovely love in there. Uh, Mutual Appreciation uh, take, Society. Uh, <laughs> yes, and good. We'll take this last here, please. Lady, sorry. My question Madam. is following on um, from self-cancelling and um, it's going to be just touching on the C word, not capitalism, comedy. I see comedy as a high level of intelligence and I'm wondering how can we sustain it as um, being an outlet, um, basically walking that fine line between being offensive to some and not offensive to others um, through cancel culture? How can we sustain? Is it through perseverance? Yeah, I think, comed no? look, there's a couple of answers. I mean, the flippant answer is comedians need to grow some balls, I suppose. But um, the, the the bigger answer is I think the internet is the answer. Uh, and that's why I'm so opposed to the online harms bill and the online, whatever it's called now, they keep changing the name. But the, the in my view, the biggest issue that we face, I feel weird sort of answering your question and with my back to you, but um, the biggest challenge uh, from my perspective, and the, and the thing that I am mo most focused on is we spent four and a half years on trigonometry pointing out the hypocrisy of this woke idiocy and also challenging some of the anti-woke idiocy that is also now starting to emerge, right? And w that is good for as long as that was happening. The problem that we have is if you don't have a positive vision of a counterculture, people aren't going to buy into it, right? And so I think what we have to start to do is to shape a positive vision of the counterculture, whether it's comedy, whether it's anything else. And people just have to go out and do stuff. They got to go out and create. The internet allows you to find your audience. So from a comedy perspective, that's part of it. And then here's the new dad part of me, which is, you know, I think this doomsday narrative that exists on the left, particularly to do with environmentalism, and on the right, there's a sort of, it's not maybe equal, but there's a similar sort of, you know, the West is all decadent and de degraded and de devoid of any values. So, you know, let's let Vladimir Putin take over. He's a good Christian of <laughs> whatever, whatever nonsense these people have bought, it, bought into. But there's a sort of like, you know, the world's over type of narrative. And that is just nonsense. And people need to have more kids, not fewer. More kids are the solution uh, instead of being the problem. Uh, so that's got to be a big part of it. And then we just have to take an honest appraisal on culturally about environmentalism. And we have to be honest. We have to say, look, th the climate is changing. Human beings contribute to it. The world's not going to end in 10 years. And if we poured all the energy that we pour onto paintings into actually working on problems and solving problems technologically, we'd be a lot better off. And by the way, we wouldn't be buying our energy from our enemies making ourselves vulnerable, making ourselves unable to respond strongly like we've seen. So that positive counterculture is forming. I'm having all sorts of conversations with all sorts of people. It's sort of behind closed doors at the moment. But believe me, there's a counterculture building. Comedians are going to be a big part of that. Satire is going to be a big part of that. Movies are going to be a big part of that because if you look at the output from Hollywood and, and wherever over the last decade, I mean, I used to love the cinema. I don't go, I haven't been to the cinema for God knows how long because it's all crap, right? Uh, and uh, that the demand is there. The market will fulfill it as long as we're still allowed to do stuff on the internet. The market will decide. Uh, gentlemen, and the last there. 
All right. Um, at the moment, we've got a Conservative government whose support for free speech and for anti-woke issues is positive, but at best feeble. Uh, we've got the prospect of a Labour government very, very strongly coming in the couple of years. Do you think we're all going to be swimming in water of a different temperature then? Can take the lady in front. Um, well, you mentioned that there is a Marxist problem um, in education, and as a student, I wholeheartedly agree. I feel like whenever I do a history essay, the professors, they want you to write about history in a certain way. I remember in my second year, I did a module on the Soviet Union, and the professors just kept talking, they kept saying that the Western historians, they were essentially, they saw so many negatives in the Soviet Union, and so we sh we were, they advise against you know, using their arguments in our essays. And I remember um, a friend of mine, she's, of, she's half Ukrainian, and she felt, she personally felt really uncomfortable um, in her lessons because these um, professors, that, you know, they've never lived in the Soviet Union before. They just kept saying, oh, you know, it, it wasn't, there were some things that weren't great, but, you know, there are other things that we can still praise. And, you know, clearly the Soviet Union was just, you know, generally, a, you know, a bad, a bad thing. Um, how do we solve this issue of, you know, the Marxist problem in education? Thank you. Uh, I don't know that you can solve the Marxist. I'll come back to the gentleman's question. I don't know that you can solve. I mean, academics are always going to lean in that direction because they like ideas that don't work but sound good. Um, this is what they do. Uh, and uh, this is some... Um, I can't remember. It's Melissa Chen. I don't know if you guys, Melissa Chen, uh, who I'm a big fan of, uh, she tweeted something a long time ago. She said, you cannot remain woke when you're building anything, whether that's muscle, whether that's a business, whether that's anything, right? So the moment you, you get in the practical real world, you start to be confronted by the reality that people are not equal. They're not born with equal intelligence or equal drive or equal passion or anything. Uh, and so the people who live in their, in their towers of academia, they're always going to be slightly deluded. And I think the way that that gets solved is the way you're solving it, which is critical thinking. Uh, you are there, you're being asked these, to do these assignments. You starting to see the flaws and the arguments that are being presented to you. And I don't imagine you're going to come out of that experience being a Marxist. So that we kind of solve that problem, certainly in your case. Um, and I think eventually over time, uh, people will grow out of it. The I don't, I mean, academia is important, but I think culture is much more important. Uh, and I think that is really, you know, the conversation I was, the point I was making to the lady there is if we can change the culture, everything else will go with it. Uh, and uh, they're always going to be Marxist professors. Uh, you know, that's, that's just what they do. Uh, but so on your point about the conservative government, I mean, I, I have some conservative friends who, who would say this isn't really a particularly conservative government. And uh, I mean, they're probably, they're probably less woke than Keir Starmer's party might be, but they're still pushing through the online safety bill, which is, as Andrew Doyle will tell you, filled with critical social justice la language and ideology from start to finish. And is, in my opinion if not purposely built, then certainly accidentally built precisely to suppress the sort of counterculture emerging that I'm talking about, where people are free to make jokes on the internet, free to speak, free to take risks, etc. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, the only thing that could possibly be worse than the current shambles is a Labour government, which we're almost certainly going to get. Yeah. So it's, it's happy days ahead, mate. Yeah. End on, end on a high. Yeah. Uh, there's, a f there's a few more. But if you always say anything, just in terms of what that lady was saying there, because it's interesting the... The way you phrased it, um, I mean, part of it I agree with and part of it I'm just a little bit kind of worried about when you say a Ukrainian student was worried. It sounded like she was being triggered by somebody saying that, you know, what was going on in the Ukraine was, you know, the fault of the Ukrainians or whatever it was. Uh, and there's a, in SOAS, you know, School of Oriental and African Studies, uh, their student union about two years ago did, did a big takeover uh, argument that how dare, you know, white Western expert professors or just call them professors um, who had spent all their years understanding Africa uh, how, how dare they teach African students because you know what do they know you know they haven't had the lived experience and they basically are in, imposing a kind of a western centric uh, understanding of Africa on the students rather than maybe a knowledgeable one I can't speak to the I think exactity. that's the opposite of the point that no I don't think, I don't think it was I, I think the fact is that there was an element of that in the question right but obviously more broadly than that she was talking about the fact that there's a 
you know, a Marxist, um, you know, uh, uh, tone to what some of the students, uh, lecturers are, are teaching them. So I think, uh, so I'm just slightly worried about the middle ground of what, what was being said there. I mean, I don't think that the teachers, you know, have to be Russian or from the Soviet Union to have an opinion um, on Soviet history. It's just that they were kind of being insensitive. I mean, it's like you just can't you just can't ignore certain things that happened in the Soviet Union. You can't just brush it away just because the dominant historiography in the West is that you know it was it was bad, and we just want to disagree with what the West says because you know we're woke and stuff. I mean, for example. Um, I have a, a teacher, a, a professor, who is very knowledgeable um, about the country my family's from, and you know, just, and he's white, and I don't disagree. Like, I don't think it's a bad thing that he's knowledgeable about about where I'm from because he, he's white. I'm just saying that you can't just, you know, forget that some things happen in history that are wrong, basically. Well, I, I actually speak to this very point in the book. Uh, I, I don't know if you've you've read it, but I, I talk about in one of the chapters why the Soviet Union was brilliant. I list all the reasons it was genuinely brilliant. Free education, free health care, uh, free child care, uh, you know, very high standard of education on the hard sciences, uh, equality for all, uh, much less wealth and income inequality that we have in this country. And as I say in the book, it's a pity you had to kill 50 million people to make it happen. Um, that's kind of the trade-offs, right? Uh, and I think uh, the point that you're making is, is a very valid one, which is, you've got people who are essentially saying you should disregard a particular way of looking at this issue because it's all Western, which seems to me actually is the exact opposite of, of the argument that's just been made. So I, I agree with you completely. Yeah, what it is opposite, but that wasn't the point I was picking up on. I was picking up on the point of her friend yeah. who was upset by what this lecture was saying. A very minor point in yeah. the entire equation. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I'm not, I'm not yeah. going to go at you. Well, what I'm but, saying is I think I would also be quite upset I mean, I would, would. I would demonstrate it differently because yeah. I'm yeah. a contrarian asshole. But th if I was in a in in that classroom, I'd be going. You have no idea what you're Precisely. talking about. Precisely. This is what happened. This is what my family Precisely. went through. It's called fighting back, yeah. arguing the case. Yeah. Exactly. Right. Yeah. That's not, wasn't the point yeah. I was making. You, sir. Um, so the I think the biggest uh, problem that we're all facing, and why a lot of people like us, like the sleeping. Giants are waking up is what's happened, and I'm old enough to remember since the 70s, is this is this creep of postmodern Marxism in the uh, elites and the universities. You're triggering Austin here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's it's, <laughs> well, it's postmodern Marxism, you can have a go all you want. Well, right? it's a combination. Uh, Jordan Peterson uh, yes. uh, uh, um, I made a good point about it. Um, and... What's happened is, especially in the humanities, but it's now creeping into, apparently math now is also um, uh, white supremacy. Um, that's another thing. Um, look it up. Um, and what's happened is that all the people who are educated in the humanities go into the media and go into all these big corporations and into government. And it's, it's an infection that runs deep in all the most powerful elites uh, in society and all the big organs of communication. And the difficulties we're having, uh, whether it's PayPal or Facebook or Twitter, is, is simply because there is a, there's a shouty elite backed up by Greta Thunberg and others um, who who get the oxygen of publicity and the monopoly on the on the public debate. And so that's the big challenge. And what we really need is a, is a proper alternative marketplace, which is your is what you're doing in your own way. But it needs to get bigger. There needs to be an alternative to PayPal. But the problem is, as uh, someone has said, these these guys are monopolies. Uh, they're not they're not capitalists at all. Uh, they are they are corporate monopolies. They're anti-capitalist. You know, capitalism is all about being able to get. You know, you vote with your feet. If you don't think this works, uh, move somewhere else. And we need we need a leakage where we can get out and challenge it. Okay, great. Thank you very much. You, madam, and you, Sophia.
Hi, um, I just um, wanted to say I really liked your Substack article about how to destroy a progressive argument, three steps to do it. Um, one, you know, where is the evidence? Two, on what grounds? I can't, can't remember the other bit. The, the, these are not mine, by the way. I should say I don't want to take credit for Thomas Sowell's work. Who's, uh, yeah, oh, those the, are, these are Thomas Sowell's three questions. Compared to what? At what evidence. cost and what, what hard evidence do you have? What hard yeah. evidence, yeah. yeah. And I, I especially liked your point in terms of how the, one of the logics to progressivism, you know, abolishing prisons, if you just presume everyone has a good nature and people only commit crimes because they're failed by the system rather than just simply being bad people. And I guess I wanted to ask, you know, what are we seeing any dangers at the moment of the excesses of progressivism beyond, you know, theoretical posturing in academia? Well, in, look, look. Sorry to interrupt, but I, fine, I, yeah. you, it's a good, really good question. So for, we'll talk about Thomas Sowell in a second because it's really important. But if you look at what's happening in places like California, where we just came back from in terms of releasing criminals from prison, in terms of not arresting people if they're stealing stuff from a shop that's worth less than $900, if you're not arresting people who are sleeping on the street and you're not actually giving them the support they need because most of them are drug addicts and have mental health issues that they need treatment for, um, then yes, you create a progressive hellhole that productive people move out of, as has happened with California. So, of course, you see that. Um, but the really interesting philosophical point that you pick up on is, that, I mean, I don't know how many people here are familiar with Thomas Sowell, the American economist, and and many other things. Absolutely, one of my favorite thinkers. And um, he wrote many, many very interesting books, but one of them is called The Conflict of Visions, in which he talks about the two visions of the world that people have. And one of them is what he calls the constrained vision, uh, which is the idea that human beings are fallible. They are flawed, they are imperfect. And the very best way to understand how human beings are likely to behave in the future is to look at their behavior in the past. So if you look at human behavior in the past, you would not be surprised when Russia invades Ukraine because people have been going to war for the entire time that human beings have existed. Um, and in every other area, you you accept that people will commit acts of murder and heinous crimes. And it's not because they've been, quote unquote, failed by the system, but because society produces a certain number of people who will commit crimes if given the opportunity and motive and whatever. The unconstrained vision, however, is the vision of the ability to perfect humankind. Uh, the idea that the, the, all the great revolutionaries, whether it's the French Revolution or the Russian Revolution, underpinned all of that, which is we can transform humanity. We can make a new man, Homo Soveticus is what he was called in the Soviet Union, who can be reprogrammed away from crime, away from having more allegiance to his family than to communism or whatever. And it is this ideology, this progressive ideology, that is at the root of a lot of things, uh, including the fact that we didn't really plan how we would deal with Russia in this sort of situation. Because what I'm saying is, I mean, it's as old as time. The Romans knew this, Civis Pacem Parabellum. If you want peace, prepare for war, because war is always coming. And it is only people who are strong who are able to resist and prevent war by showing strength in advance of the war, right? So there are all sorts of areas where this very optimistic but inaccurate way of thinking is damaging our societies internally, but also geopolitically, and, and it's a big problem. Final word, sir. So congratulations on the baby. Thank you. And this is a good segue to the question. So what would be your advice to second generation immigrants suffering from an identity crisis? <laughs> Like me, so for example, I was born in this city, but my face is from Egypt. Uh, at school, a small minority used to call me a terrorist. Mm. Fast forward three decades later, I'm Mohammed Salah. Uh, so, so this is, I think it's a key question that yeah. there's a identity crisis, especially if it's top down, it, there seems to be, we're destroying our values. And if there's nothing that pulls us together, then what is your advice? Yeah. It's a really good question, actually, a really good one uh, to finish on. 
I don't know exactly what you mean because identity crisis is two words and what you are personally experiencing, I don't know. Uh, I think uh, in terms of, you know, being bullied at school and all that sort of thing, the the valuable thing that my parents always taught me, and it's, it's very uh, bigoted and prejudiced, but they always said, look, there's a bell curve of IQ in society. Some people are idiots and the people who are being racist to you are probably idiots. So you probably should just ignore them, right? Oh my yeah, of course, right. And they're, 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 they're one of the tales of the of the bell curve, right? Um, uh, so that's what I would deal with. But in terms of your identity now, I would say to you, what do you believe? Do you believe in Western values? Do you believe in British values? Do you believe in democracy? Do you believe in freedom? Do you believe in the right of people to speak their mind even if it offends you or others? Uh, and if you do, then you are as British as anybody. You've come to this country or your parents uh, came to this country and you grew up here. Uh, you're as British as anybody. Make yourself British. Contribute to the society. I don't know what you do for a living or what you're going to do for a living. But for me, uh, you know, when um, Brian asked me about what I'm most proud of, like I said, I'm most proud of that I, I contribute to this society, that I've built something here that other people benefit from. And if you do that... Uh, I don't think you need to have an identity crisis. Your face is not from Egypt. Your face is from wherever your face is. You know, your genetics are what they are. It doesn't make you anything other than genetics. People can live in different parts. So you've got a, a point you want to make. The crisis is that I'm trying to uphold the values that are in your book. Yeah. I'm trying to uphold the values that are in your book. Yeah. But if it's all crumbling around me, yeah. then there's nothing for me to hold on to. I understand. So then I'm and just this, an Egyptian yeah. living in the UK. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and this is the doomsday narrative that I've been talking about. And my book is full of warnings and predictions about things going wrong if we don't. But I believe it's people like you and it's people like me and it's like everybody else in this room that if we believe that these things are worth defending and we actually defend them, then they will not crumble. That's why I wrote the book. And I think that's why you asked the question because you don't want these things to crumble because you believe in them. And I think you got to lean in, my friend. You got to go, this is what I believe. I'm going to stand up for it. I'm going to fight for it. And if it crumbles, it crumbles, but I've done my best. I think that's the answer to your question. I think that's a very good point. <laughs> yeah, shut up. <laughs> Round of applause. Uh, very, very finally, I mean, my two penneth is that, I mean, don't have an identity crisis. It's got nothing to do with your identity. It's to do with your, what you believe, what you think, what your politics are, and it's broader than your personal identity. Uh, I'm Welsh, but I very rarely tell you that because uh, it's got nothing to do with anybody and it plays a very small part in my life. Uh, I'm more interested in democracy and, uh, and political ideas. Um, that said, um, I also think that the, the name progressive, which is where we started the conversation, is such now an abused term because everybody who's progressive and says that they are are the most reactionary mm -hmm. twats you could ever come across, right? So I think we need to either, like I say, reclaim some of these words or use them in a different different formulation because uh, I think we need to understand what progress means. Progress, development, as you say about environmentalism, mm -hmm. it's about development, not sustainable development. It's about really kind of humanity being put first. So I think I'm a great believer in that. But it also means reclaiming the idea of Marx uh, because, not, <laughs> not, not because I'm trying to convince you to be Marxist, but I'm saying that there is an abuse of, the, of what I've heard today. It's just not what Marxism is. Um, but on that note, thank you all very much for coming. Very, very generous of you to ask your questions. Round of applause for Constantine. Thank you, guys. Thank you. And if you don't have it, on the bookstall now. <laughs>